Now, I wonder if you'll turn to page 1037 uh, for our Bible reading today, and uh, it's going to be read to us by Ruth. After this, Jesus travelled about from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him, and also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out, Joanna, the wife of Cusa, the manager of Herod's household, Susanna, and many others. These women were helping to support them out of their own means. While a large crowd was gathering and people were coming to Jesus from town after town, he told this parable. A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path. It was trampled on and the birds of the air ate it up. Some fell on rock and when it came up, the plants withered because they had no moisture. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up with it and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up and yielded a crop a hundred times more than was sown. When he said this, he called out, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. His disciples asked him what this parable meant. He said, The knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but to others I speak in parables, so that, though seeing, they may not see, though hearing, they may not understand. This is the meaning of the parable. The seed is the word of God. Those along the path are the ones who hear. And then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. Those on the rock are the ones who receive the word with joy when they hear it, but they have no root. They believe for a while, but in the time of testing, they fall away. The seed that fell among thorns stands for those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by life's worries, riches, and pleasures, and they do not mature. But the seed on good soil stands for those with a noble and good heart who hear the word, retain it, and by persevering, produce a crop. Tomorrow, Ruth and I are off to London for a couple of days to see the grandchildren. And then we'll have a break. Uh, (laughs) When we're with them, On Sundays, we normally worship in a historic church in the East End of London called Christ Church Spitalfields. And one Sunday, we were there, and uh, we we were sitting towards the back, and uh, at the front, there was a a kiddie's uh, paddling pool, you know, about this depth, and yeah. You know the kind of thing. And I thought, oh, that's going to be the children's address this morning. And then there was a baptism. And I thought, hey-ho. And uh, there was a a young uh, woman, I suppose, of student age, you know, early 20s. There was, uh, let's say, a mature lady uh, of the vintage that still wore hats. And there were a, a couple of others. And uh, the vicar, true to form, didn't look like any vicar you imagine from television. He was in jeans and an open neck shirt. And when we came to the baptism, uh, he climbed into the paddling pool. And then something very interesting happened. Uh, At least one of those being baptized was baptized by immersion. And the lady with the hat, she must have taken it off, but I don't remember. She, she, she was wearing more, of course. Uh, she, <laughs> she, she was baptized by sprinkling. And I thought, I've never seen that before. And I, I, I thought about that, and I, I still think about that. But the, the, the other thing that struck me was when uh, the student uh, sort of got up from being immersed and kind of stepped over uh, the edge of the pool onto the, and she was dripping, uh, onto the wet tiles, I got a bit worried about her. 
because she started... You know the story in, in Acts chapter 3, when at the gate beautiful, Peter and John are going into the temple, and they heal the man who had been born uh, incapacitated. He couldn't, he couldn't stand. And he was healed, and the Scripture says he followed them, what was it, uh, uh, walking, leaping, praising the Lord. And this girl, she went ecstatic, and she was walking, leaping, praising the Lord as she was led out to get into clothes, to dry clothes for the rest of the service. That was her response. The response of the woman with the hat was very different. She just uh, put her hat on again, I think, and returned to her seat. Very different responses to being received into the Christian fellowship through baptism. And this morning, the parable is not about a sower. It's all about responses. Ears to hear is the title, and eyes to see. And let's now pray that the Lord will make our response what He would desire. Lord God, thank You for Your Word. Grant that this morning, as we hear it, our eyes may be opened, our ears may be unstopped and cleansed. May we see and hear and respond as you would have us. And to Jesus be all the glory. Amen. This morning we start a new series of morning sermons on parables of Jesus from the gospel according to St. Luke. The first one is a very, very well-known parable, what we call the parable of the sower. And at this stage in our Lord's ministry, it, there are changes, there are developments. Our, Lord, our Lord's ministry began with His baptism, with His anointing of the Spirit from on high, with the confirmation of who He was, God's Son, the voice from heaven, and then He was tempted. And then the next thing Luke tells us is He went home to the synagogue in Nazareth. He quoted scriptures about the Messiah, and He said, today this scripture is being fulfilled in your midst. He was claiming to be the Christ the Lord's anointed, and that after his first sermon, he had his, the first attempt on his life. They wanted to throw him over the precipice. He begins his ministry teaching in synagogues, healing and driving out demons, and as he goes, the accounts of him calling various disciples uh, takes place. And when we get to chapter 6, the 12 are mentioned. His ministry continues, but it isn't until chapter 8, where we're beginning now, that he moves out from his uh, synagogue preaching to broader preaching. We see, look at verses 1 to 3, and when, when I learned that I was to preach on the, on the parable of the sower, I thought, dear Lord, give me something new to say, because this is very familiar territory, isn't it? You all know this parable from Sunday school. Well, I, I haven't sought novelty just for novelty's sake, but look at the introduction. 
First of all, he was traveling, verse 1, from town to town, not just in synagogues. Secondly, he was traveling with companions of two kinds. In verse 1, it specified the twelve were with him. So, Jesus had gathered a team. Jesus had gathered a team. In, in Mark's gospel, we read that he called twelve that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach the word. Jesus gathered a team that they might be with him. Isn't it interesting that our Lord sought company? He sought company. He sought the fellowship, the community of the early disciples, especially the twelve, and in a, a most intimate way, the three, Peter and James and John, who were with him on the Mount of Transfiguration, who were with him in the Garden of Gethsemane. There's no such thing as a Christian completely on their own. We are all part of a community, a fellowship, a company that we might support one another. So, the twelve were with him. And uh, then, uh, uh, secondly, a group of women were with him. Some women, verse 2. Now, contemporary culture, the culture of Palestine of the day, restricted what a woman could do. Her place was in the home. It would have been very strange, although after Pentecost the rules were broken, but it would have been very strange for her to be preaching and teaching. But these women did what they could. And what could they do? Well, we are told. They supported, verse 3, the disciples, Jesus and his disciples, by their means. They supported the disciples by… They must have been women of some substance. One of them, at least, was married to a very high official in, in Herod's court. And they, from their means, meant that the disciples could be fed and watered and Jesus as well. And why did they do that? Let's note, they were motivated by gratitude. They were motiv motivated by gratitude. Some women, note, who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases, and then they're named. Uh, and note that Mary uh, Magdalene had been cured of seven demons. There is no record in the Scriptures that Mary Magdalene was immoral. No record whatsoever. That's a later tradition which you can take or leave. She had been demon-possessed, and the Lord had wonderfully freed her, and others had been healed, and they wanted to show their gratitude by sharing of their means. And the final thing to note in verse 4, a large crowd was gathering. And so, Jesus then, it's recorded, that He told the parable. We all know the parable. It's very familiar. Four soils, the sower sows his seed on the hard-beaten path, on the rocky ground, among thorns, and in the good soil. We all know that story. And then we are told that he, uh, how does it put it? He called out, verse uh, 8. He didn't just say, he called out. He who has ears, let him hear. He's calling for a response. 
And the disciples say, well, um, what's this all mean, Lord? And then you get this, these very difficult verses, uh, 10 and 11. Uh, he says, I'm telling parables, the stories, to everybody. But to you, I'm giving the interpretation. And the interpretation is this, and the first thing he says is, the seed is the word of God. This isn't a country story that they would all be familiar with, with a sower going out and broadcasting the seed. No, this has a deeper meaning. Now, we're familiar with that. From my Sunday school days, I don't know who told me, but I trawl from the depths of my memory. A parable is, a heaven, is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Now, I'm not sure I agree entirely with that wording, but that is what I was taught, and you were probably taught something like that as well. The first hearers would have just thought of it as an earthly story. But now Jesus gives his interpretation, and his interpretation is about the different soils which give different responses. And note, he's teaching not the crowd. They heard the parable. They didn't hear the interpretation. He's teaching the disciples about responding. And that means now that we who gather as a company of disciples, he is talking to us about our response. So, let's look at the response. Four categories. First, uh, verse 5 and the interpretation in verse 12, we have what I call the hard pathers the hard pathers, the seed sown on hard, beaten soil, soil where many people had walked on and was baked by the hot sun. No wonder the response was zilch. It says, it was, verse 5, trampled on, trod upon, And it struck me, many people are resistant to the gospel. They're hard and they don't respond. Why? Because they have been trod upon. They have been beaten down. Beaten down by life and the circumstances of life. Beaten down by other people who have been cruel, sharp with words, whatever. Beaten down, God forgive us, sometimes by the church. Beaten down by themselves and their own inability to forgive. They're clinging on to resentment and they're just keeping themselves down. They're as hard as nails. Some people in Ulster have heard the gospel so many times, they've been inoculated, and they're hard, hard, hard. And verse 12, in interpreting this, takes us to another level. Those along the path are the ones to hear, who hear, and, and note this, and then the devil comes and takes away the word from their heart. One level is them being beaten down. Another level is that of spiritual battle. And the devil is doing his damnedest. And I thought about it. Hold on, Billy. You can't use that word from the pulpit. Well, I've never used it before, and I may never use it again. But when referring to the devil, maybe I'm rejoicing that I can use it now, uh, we can say he's doing his damnedest to make sure that the Word goes no further than our ears. 
He keeps it from uh, reaching our hearts. If he succeeds, we do not trust. As the text says, we do not trust God and we are not saved. And what do we do with hard pathers? It's very difficult. But what we do is we love them, we care for them, we pray for them, that the the hard soil of their hearts may begin to crack and the seed may enter and they may be enabled to receive the word and respond. Second group, the no rooters, verse 6, and the interpretation in verse 13. The seed fell on, Luke's gospel has it on rock. The uh, other versions have uh, on rocky places where the soil is, is very shallow because it's thinly spread over bedrock. And uh, they have no root because there's no, very little soil for roots to develop. And verse 6, they wither. But note, they receive the word initially with joy. I don't know about uh, the young lady who went walking and leaping and praising the Lord in Christ Church Spitalfields some years ago. I trust uh, she is still walking with the Lord. But emotion is not enough. A common worry of young Christians who have committed themselves to Christ, maybe at a meeting, maybe in a small group, and they, they, they feel an, an overwhelming feeling of joy and therefore praising the Lord And two days later, they feel as flat as a pancake, and they worry. Was it really true? Has Christ really come into my life? Is my life really transformed? The emotion doesn't last. It will return from time to time, but such very young babies in the faith need to be encouraged, helped, uh, informed, and instructed. Because if it's only emotion, it doesn't last. Now, Presbyterians are a bit frightened of emotion, and we need a bit of an injection. But uh, some other Christian traditions have too much. So we just want the balance that is the scriptural balance. And their roots are not nourished. this version and Luke's version talks about they, they produce no fruit, withered. Why? Because they had no moisture. There was no nourishment. The purpose of roots is to draw the nourishment that feeds the plant from the soil. No nourishment. We need roots. And the challenge that comes to you and the challenge that comes to me is how deep are our roots? Paul writes in Colossians 2, as you have received Jesus as Lord, continue to live in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thanksgiving. Or in a similar passage in Ephesians 3, Paul prays, I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have the power, together with all the saints, with all the saints' community again, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. What about your roots? What about your roots? Uh, The Weight Watchers, I think, 
uh, use our premises a couple of times a week. I'm not sure. I imagine for people who think they are overweight, and that doesn't make them bad people. Believe it or not, I am in danger of moving from one waist size to another, so I'm trying to lose a few pounds. So there you go. Uh, we need to be weight watchers, spiritual weight watchers. It's not that we're too heavy, we're too light, and our roots are not down deeply into Him that we may be built up. Matthew, uh, Mark's version says, when trouble and persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. What about your roots? Third, the life chokers, the seed that falls among thorns, verses 7 and 14. It fell among thorns which grew up with them and then chokes them. Now, I married a weed assassin. Ruth and I like to walk every day, and if you see us, you'll see us hand in hand. Romance at our age, it's amazing. Anyway, when we come back, it often happens that I'm ready for a coffee, and uh, I accelerate and open the door and turn around, and Ruth is hunkered down, pulling out weeds. I say, come on. She says, no, if we leave these here, they are about to seed, and then next week there will be an awful lot more of them. So she just pulls out the weeds because they will grow up and the flowers and the other plants will be fighting for limited resources. And what's the interpretation of this? The seed falls among weeds, and as they go on their way, people who receive the word in these circumstances, verse, verse 14, they are choked by life's worries, riches, and pleasure. And just to say about that, worries, things we don't hand over to God as we should. Riches, things we don't share with people as we should. Pleasure, Emotions which we don't seek from God, but from other sources that will never satisfy. And what do we read? They do not mature. We end up stunted, weak, and of not much use to anyone. A question of possessions, pleasures, concerns, and priorities. Now, does that ring bells with anyone here? What about our maturity, our growth? Are we letting ourselves be choked by other things? What are we going to do about it? Finally, good croppers, verse 8 and verse 15. The disciples must have been getting very concerned when they'd heard uh, this explanation so far because there were groups, many people, a multitude gathering, and many were responding, and they were saying, Jesus, does that mean nobody is going to produce fruit? The response of the crowd is going to be totally inadequate? And Jesus says, no, no. Some seed will fall on good soil, and it will produce 
a hundred times more than the seed that was sown. A hundred times, some not so much, 60, some 30 or 40. But there will be a harvest. And that's good for us to hear. I think of people working in areas where there is very little response, some very resistant areas. Our own society is becoming more resistant, but we'll be praying later for Helen in Japan, a very resistant area. And for people working so hard to present the gospel and with so little result, here we have it, in his time, the Lord will give fruit. And that is what that hope is what has kept pioneer missionaries and others in the field still working. There will be a plentiful harvest. And those who produce a good harvest uh, produce it, uh, those with an, a noble and good heart who hear the word retain it, and by perseverance. People who hold on and who hang on produce the fruit. As I've said, this is all about response and the response of hearers. And I challenge you tonight, this morning as I, as I myself am challenged, am I a hard pather or a no rooter or a life choker or a good cropper? Our mission is to continue the mission of our Lord in the power of the Spirit. With the gospel of the kingdom, the gospel that proclaims that Jesus is King. May He grant us as we are led to respond this morning to share in that wonderful service. Let's take a moment's silence. Lord, you, you know our hearts. You see behind the masks, the facade, the pretense. You know us as we are. in mercy and love. Help us to respond and be as you would have us be. In Jesus' name, amen. we pray. Lord, thank you for the example of the women who walked with Jesus and who helped support the disciple band from their own resources. Their service was an act of gratitude for the amazing healings and releases which you gave them. We are in awe of the demonstration of your love and power to free Mary Magdalene from seven demons. And we would follow their example and bring this our offering from our resources, 
Your love to us has not been so spectacular, but is just as real in forgiving us our sin, in freeing us from the works of the devil, and providing for us the daily needs of body and soul, which we enjoy and our families. These gifts are our grateful response for your immense, immeasurable goodness and generosity. Thank you for your word this morning and for the picture it presents of four different responses to it. And we pray for the kinds of people we have considered. We pray for those who have been so trod upon and trampled that they are, to our eyes, totally hardened to the gospel. Forgive us where the church has contributed to their condition and help us to so love and care and pray that cracks may appear in their armor and the seed of the gospel may penetrate and work its miraculous work. We pray for those ministering to such people and to resistant cultures throughout the world. We pray for Helen in Japan and for her two week-long tours before she comes on a visit to Ireland next month. We pray for James and Heather in Portugal and the work they hope to start in a poor area of social housing there. We pray for those without roots and spiritual sustenance. Lord, help them, help us to be rooted into Jesus and to be built up in his love. We pray for those being daily choked by things, worries and stuff and pleasure. Help them, help us to offer up to you our concerns and to seek fulfillment not in possessions or pleasure, but in the riches of your grace. We thank you for the Savior's faithful followers who produce much fruit. Empty us of self Fill us with your goodness that we may be found in their number on the day of trial and testing. We pray for those close to us who came to our mind during this sermon, members of our family and circle. Lord, bring them back Raise them up. Grant them a local support of fellowship. Heal hurts. Grant forgiveness and give hope and encourage faith, we pray. We pray for those going through times of testing today and for the, the church and people of Rwanda at the beginning of the annual commemoration of the genocide in which nearly one million people were slaughtered in 100 days. For them and for those much nearer us, we pray. In the Savior's name,